I wonder if you've noticed that when we finish a book of the Bible, as we did just a few weeks ago with Luke, that we'll oftentimes then spend a few weeks in the Psalms after that. We don't usually go right into the beginning of another book. That'll be sometime not too far away. But right now, we're in this little mini, one of these little mini-series that we consider after we finish a book of the Bible, a mini-series through the Psalms. And I don't know if I've ever told you this before, maybe I have, maybe I'm repeating myself, <coughs> but I thought I might just take a moment today to explain why we do that, why we go from Luke to the Psalms before we jump into another book. For one thing, there's 150 Psalms, okay? So if we preach all the way through the Psalms in one chunk, that would be a really long series, okay, years. But there's another reason, another reason, and I want to illustrate it this way. Um, every baseball season, before baseball season starts, what do they have? They have a few weeks of, of spring training, okay? And what do they do in spring training? Well, for one thing, they get everybody in the different organizations together. The seasoned veterans together with those rookies straight out of college, even some of them straight out of high school. Everybody's together, and what do they do? They get back to the basics. Running, catching, fielding. Bunting. Everybody, even, even the future Hall of Famers, are working on their bunting in, in, spring, in spring training. Back to the basics. Back to the fundamentals. And I want to argue that the Psalms, they're a kind of theological spring training. They take us back to the basics. The basics of who God is. The basics of, of who we are. The basics of what life is like in a, in a fallen, cursed world. And the basics of how we respond to God and all of it. What do we need to know? What do we need to believe? What do we need to see? And what do we need to cling to if we're going to function, survive, worship in a world like ours? David and the other psalmists, they face trouble. They face danger and loneliness and fear, hopelessness. What we might call in our age things like depression and despair. you Look for those things in the Psalms, you'll find them, page after page after page. We find not just their despair, that we find how they responded to, that, to, to, to those experiences of despair, experiences of oppression. And again and again, we see their response. We see that they choose to trust God, even when the circumstances make it difficult, even when the circumstances seem hopeless. So the Psalms take us back to the basics. They take us back to the fundamentals. See there that God keeps his word to his people. Again, 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 God makes promises to his people and he keeps those promises. We can trust him. Now, the Psalm we look at this morning is a little bit different. In lots of the Psalms, maybe most of the Psalms, I didn't count. In many of the Psalms, the first thing we see is the psalmist's condition, the problem, the situation, the pain, the fear, the suffering, the oppression, okay? Maybe the psalmist even complains to God. God, where are you? How long, O oh Lord, will we suffer? What's going on? Where I can't find you. You don't seem to be hearing my prayers. These are the kinds of the things that psalmists pray, David and others. Then they mull over their circumstance, and by the end, Psalmists again and again return to the fundamentals, the basics, to the truth that God is faithful, that God is reliable, that God speaks truth, that God is just, he judges the wicked, and he's also merciful. He receives those who come to him humbly, seeking his help. However, like I said, Psalm 46 isn't like that. What comes first isn't the psalmist's complaint, but it's, it's his commitment to trust God. So let's look at the 46th Psalm. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a psalm. Now, we don't know what Alamoth is. It might have something to do with a hymn tune or an instrument. We're just not sure. All kinds of speculation. We do know a little, about, little bit about the sons of Korah. Okay, so they're the, uh, the member of the Levitical family that's responsible for, for singing as a part of the worship at the tabernacle at the end of the temple. If you think back to the Chronicles, where we were maybe six months or so ago, we, we saw a little bit about them as we studied Chronicles. 
Now, I, I'm going to try to refer to them, the sons of Korah, since it seems like this was a, a group effort to write this psalm. I'm going to try to refer to them as the psalmists, plural. If I fall into calling them a psalmist like I would if it were David, forgive me for that. It seems as though this, this group of men work together to compose this psalm. And what they do first is affirm their commitment to trust God. Look at me in verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. You see, answers to three questions in the psalm today. The first question is, who is God to people in trouble? These sons of Korah, the psalmists, they tell us who God is to people who are in trouble, okay? So understand, when I say that the psalmists begin by stating their commitment to, to trust God, I'm not saying that everything in their lives is rosy, okay? You, you can see it there in the first phrase of the psalm. God is our refuge and strength, okay? When do you need refuge and strength? You need refuge when there is an assault upon you. You need strength when you're weak, when you are not capable of, of, of sustaining yourself against the assault. You need a refuge when something has gone terribly wrong, when something's closing in. Maybe it's enemies. Maybe it's a natural disaster. In fact, it's a natural disaster that the, the, that the psalmist describe here in the next, next couple of verses. They imagine a disaster of disasters. Do you see that there in verses 2 and 3? The earth is falling apart. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Something like that when the, when the earth begins to crumble under your feet, when the earth begins to sink back, back into the sea. Something like this. And yet the psalmist say, even if the very worst happens, beginning of verse 2, we will not fear. All right, church. Have we made that commitment? Have we made that commitment that even if the worst of the worst happens, we will not fear? Or are we quickly aroused to fear by whatever it is we saw on cable news or on social media or on somebody's podcast over the last day or two? Does that arouse us to fear? Whatever we heard about, it was not the earth collapsing into the water under our feet. Psalmists say, we will not fear. How are we doing that? Now think about this. The psalmists are imagining, imagining the, the uncreation, the decreation of the world. Okay, so think back to Genesis 1 for a second. Do you remember what happens on the third day of creation? Okay, the kids who've been through Kids Point, they could probably tell us. Do we remember what happened on the third day of creation? Let me help you out. God says in Genesis 1, let the waters be gathered together and let the dry land appear. Okay, so the, the waters have covered the surface of the earth. And now the waters are gathered together. The dry land emerges from underneath the water. What's happening in verses 2 and 3 of our psalm? It's the reversal of that, isn't it? It's, it's the sea roaring. And what happens to the mountains? The mountains melt back into the water. The psalmists are describing the decreation of the earth. And saying, even on that day, we will not be afraid. That's even if that happens, do not fear. The same God who spoke the water into existence, who by his word parted those waters so that the earth could emerge, that same God still reigns over us today. He has not lost, you know, one little ounce of his power. God isn't, God didn't work out too hard, so he's feeling kind of weak and sore today. Okay? Our God reigns every bit as much as he did then. Floods still threaten. You've heard the news from the last week. Houston damaged badly by flooding over this past week from all the rain. But floods don't threaten God, even if they threaten our earthly shelter. Floods may separate us from the shelter of our house, but they will never separate us from the shelter of God's hand. So brothers and sisters, set an anchor. Anchor your hopes. Anchor your hopes on tangible things in this age, and you'll be disappointed. Okay, your, your new patio, that's not peace, right? Retirement, your favorite retirement spot is not rest. 
and, and your surveillance system and your gun safe, they are not security. You can't save your soul. And it's not just water that we need to be worried about. Okay, It's not just ground melting back into the seas. You may, know, you may know the name Martin Luther. He was a German monk in the 1500s. And, and if you follow the story, he, he helped God's people re recover the gospel when a corrupt church had obscured it, when traditions and false teachings and, and errors of buying your way into heaven had, over, had overwhelmed the truth of the gospel. Martin Luther helped bring it back, helped re recover it and, and, and shine light on it again. Martin Luther talked about this psalm. He wrote about this psalm seeing that it's not just about natural dangers, it's also about, it's pointing us towards spiritual dangers, spiritual enemies lurking in the seas. And he wrote, come, let us sing the 46th psalm and let them, let those enemies, let them do their worst. We sing this psalm to the praise of God. Why? Because God is with us and powerfully and miraculously defends his church and his word against all fanatical spirits, against the gates of hell, against the implacable hatred of the devil, and against all the assaults of the world, the flesh, and sin. Read this song and be reassured that you need not fear, because our God reigns. Kids, let me ask you, what scares you? Right, so for some of you, it's a natural disaster that scares you. Right, whether you hear about hurricane warnings or about a tornado warning that we've heard about you know, these last couple of weeks. Maybe it's a bad dream or, or something that happens to you at school that shouldn't happen to you. Maybe what scares you is, you know, your dad's driving. Don't start, don't start laughing there in the back row at me on that one, all right? That wasn't for you kids. That was for other kids. Moms, what scares you? Maybe, maybe it's the fact that you can't protect your kids from all those things, all those places, all those dangers, even their dad's driving, right? That may be what scares you, Mom. Remember, <coughs> verse 1. Look at it again. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Just let those words sink there for a second. Very present help. All right, when, when, when people in our lives, people in our church, when, when they're in trouble, when they're struggling, when they're ill, what do we do? Oh, she has not been feeling well for a while. I need to check in with her, is what we're saying, right? Is that what God does? Friends, our God is not a God who checks in on us with a text message. He is a God who is present with us. He offers us a safe place, not, not a tornado cellar. No, he is the safe place. He is the refuge. He is the shelter. He is the strength. So friends, who is God to people in trouble? He is the sovereign creator who is with us to help us serve us, to deliver us. But this psalm addresses a second question, not just who is God to people in trouble, but what does God promise to people in trouble? Hint, he promises us a city. Look at verses 4 through 7. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. What does God promise to people in trouble? The psalmist described a city where there is no longer any trouble. Now there is still water in the city. In the first part of the psalm, we saw that the, the, the waters gobble up the mountains. But the waters here in the second part of the psalm, they're not roaring, foaming seas that, that cause fear. No, they're a river with streams that cause joy, that, that, that quench the thirst of God's people. Now, the geography of this might sound a little strange. Look back there at verse 4. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. We don't usually think of a river as having streams, we think of a river as being made up of streams, right? So, you know, you think of the Mississippi River, the lots of rivers, the Ohio River, the, 
Missouri River, the Arkansas River, they all converge to, to make the, the mighty Mississippi so, so wide with so many ships, cargo ships going up and down as you cross over on one of those bridges. But the psalmist isn't describing a Mississippi River here, but he's describing a, a unique place. A unique place that should sound familiar because I think the psalmist is bringing to our mind something we know about in the Garden of Eden. Think back to Genesis chapter 2. What, what's, in, in, what's described in, in, in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2? Well, there's a river, isn't there? Not a river that's made up of four streams that describes the, the boundaries of the lands that are marked by these four rivers. But no, Genesis 2.10 says that a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. It kind of sounds like an underground spring, well enough. And there, there in, out of flowing out of Eden, it divided, the river divided and became four rivers. Not four rivers coming together into one, but one river dividing into four, just like what we see here. There's a river with streams that make glad the city of God. The picture is of a river emerging from one source and then branching out to satisfy all of God's city. So, so do you see what Saulus is describing here? He's describing one stream flowing from, flowing from one place to feed God's city, to nourish it with, with water from God. Then in verse 5, God is in the middle of all this. God is in the middle of all this, in the midst of her, in the midst of the city. And this should sound familiar too. It's what we read this morning, isn't it? It's Revelation chapter 22, where God is in his city with his people. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from, do you remember? Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. A river of water beginning from one source that nourishes God's people gathered around him. So do you see, you see what the psalmists describe here? They're describing the city of God with creation language and with like new heavens and new earth language. He's fusing creation to the new creation. The place that God crafted for his people by his word in the first pages of Genesis is even better in the last pages of Revelation. You weren't expecting to get the doctrine of eschatology, the doctrine of the future this morning, were you? You weren't, you weren't thinking, oh, we get Revelation from Psalm 46. Well, here it is. Here it is. Psalm 46 fuses Genesis 1, the first page of the Bible, to Revelation 22, the very last page of the Bible. And what's the point of that? What's the point of that? Well, we live in a world that's not like the garden and is not like Revelation 22 either, is it? We live in a world that's full of turmoil. I mean, we can just list example after example that you saw in the headlines yesterday, maybe already in the morning, uh, this, this morning, of the turmoil that's manifested in this world. People at war against each other, nations raging. And the psalmist say, turmoil on earth is no reason for us to be afraid. If, if verse 4 is true, if there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, if God has taken up habitation in his city, and if he invites us and welcomes us into that city, then friends, we have no reason to be afraid. Because we know how the story ends, and we are with God as his people. Canaanites believed that the greatest of the gods lived on, on a high mountain. Okay? Who is God here in this passage? There in verse 4, he is God most high. The God, the one God who sits above all the others. God most high, El Elyon says, there is no room at the top of this mountain. There is no room in, the, in my holy habitation for any other God but one. And there I sit on my throne. I will not allow no others to challenge. And friends, understand this. This is God's description through the psalmist of his place for his people under his blessing forevermore. And understand this as well. This is not just in the future. We are already tasting this reign of God. So look at verse 6. All this happens while the nations rage. God sits enthroned in his holy habitation while the nations rage. While the nations rage, God's city is secure. And remember, 
we are citizens of that city. We're ambassadors, right? Living outside our home country in heaven. We're ambassadors sent into this world with a message from the king. Okay? Ambassadors are not always safe in their country that they've been sent to. We may not be safe in this world, and yet we've been commissioned with a message from the king. But the fact that we may not be safe in this, this foreign land to us does not mean that God's habitation is insecure. Oh no, one day he will recall his ambassadors home to be with him. And he will extend the, 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 the reign of his kingdom to every nation on earth, so that there will not be left one square inch that is not under the full dominion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We belong to King Jesus. God is in the midst of his city. And, and Jesus is God in the midst of us. He is Emmanuel. God with us. He took on flesh. He dwelt among us, made his holy habitation in human flesh among us. And so because Jesus is with us, even with us now in the person of his Holy Spirit, Jesus is with us and we need not be moved. We have the help that we need. God has helped us through the death and resurrection of Christ. And God helps us now through the power of his Holy Spirit. And he will help us on this last day by declaring us righteous. Not guilty and positively righteous despite all the sin we've committed in rebellion against him. He will call us his sons and daughters. He will call us joint heirs with Christ, not because of our works, but because of the finished work of the Lamb who sits on the throne. That is how God saves. Do you remember in Exodus? It's been years now since we studied this, but back in Exodus, you may know the story, but when God saves Israel from slavery in Egypt. Remember that? They, they escape Egypt, and then the Egyptians pursue with their armies, with their chariots, and Israel's pinned. They are trapped between the Egyptian armies and, and the Red Sea. But in the night, in the night, God sends a wind that opens a, a path, a way of escape for the Israelites through the sea. Israel passes between the waters overnight, and when they're safe, God says to Moses, now, Stretch out your hand again over the sea. Exodus 14, 27 tells us, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. God saved his people when morning came. Well, here, in Psalm 46, we find something very similar. The nations rage, verse 6, the kingdoms totter, the, he utters his voice, the earth melts. And yet God is in the midst of his people, verse 5, she shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning comes. When the nations rage, God helps when the morning comes. Just like Israel, we need an exodus. We need deliverance from satanic oppression. We need deliverance from our own sin that has put us in a hostile relationship with God. We need new life. We need a new home in the land that God has promised, the city of God, the psalmist described. Friends, do we have any help from God when morning comes? Well, I'd suggest to you that if you remember Luke 24 at all, Luke 22, 23, 24, those last passages where we were just a few weeks ago in, in Luke's gospel, that there was a morning when Jesus conquered death, when Jesus made a way for us to come home, and it happened when the morning came, on resurrection day. Brothers and sisters, that is the morning that we need. We need hope fixed on the life of Jesus Christ. And that morning has come. Look to Christ now in the midst of a world full of turmoil, and look to Christ in a world that's full of turmoil in part because our sin my sin has caused it. A world in which we have no hope for deliverance apart from God's mercy, not just on the world, but God's mercy on us. Because we feel these things. So friends, you look around. You feel the nations raging. Maybe you feel your heart raging. You feel in your heart hostility against God and his word and rebellion against him. Friends, Understand that our hope is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You, you feel the nations raging. That is not a sign of their power.
it's actually a sign that they're tottering here. Do you see that, verse 6? The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. Go back sometime and listen to a, a recording of September 11, 2001, when the World Trade Center collapsed. Just listen to the sound of it. Don't watch the commentators talking about it. Listen to one of those recordings that has the sound of those buildings crumbling. The noise is awful. The kingdoms of this world make a lot of noise in their war against God, but that war is not the sound of their power. It's the sound of their implosion. It's the roar of their anger as they collapse upon themselves, as God's inevitable, inevitable victory draws nearer and nearer. So earthly turmoil, it's not a sign that evil is winning. Earthly turmoil is a sign of God's judgment. David preached just last week in Sunday school about, about prayer that a mountain would be cast into the sea. And it didn't dawn on me then while we were talking about that a few weeks ago as you preached it. I wonder if there's even a, an allusion in that, that mountain being cast into the sea to something we see here in the Psalms. That God utters his voice and brings judgment upon the earth, just as he was planning to bring judgment upon Israel. And Israel rebelled against him. So friends, let's not be surprised that the nations rage. I mean, this is what Psalm 2 reminds us of. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, his Messiah, saying, let us burst their bonds apart. Let us cast away their cords from us. We will not be ruled. Reject his authority. Live our own way. Make our own rules. And what does God do? He who sits in the heavens laughs. It's a tragedy, yes, but it's a tragic comedy that the people made the flesh into whom God has breathed life, thinking that we can war against him and win it. So friends, as the nations totter, God's city is unmoved. This made me think of a line in our national anthem. Now, I know you're not all American citizens. Allow me just to use this illusion as an illustration. Okay, so you know that, this, that our national anthem came out of, uh, out, of, uh, out of the War of 1812. There's a nighttime British assault in Baltimore Harbor. But Francis Scott Key looked up in the midst of the nighttime bombardment and saw that the American flag still waved over the fort, over the city. He wrote these words, the, the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. So the assault, the, the, the bombardment, the light of the explosions actually spotlighted the victorious flag as it still waved. Now, there will be no American flag waving over the kingdom of God, right? There's no American flag planted in God's city, the New Jerusalem, right? It is the throne of God and of the Lamb, not of American history. However, I think the line that, from that song illustrates what we see here about the raging nations in the midst of the bombardment of the, of the kingdom of Jesus that the nations intend to bring upon it. The, victor the victory of the Lamb is spotlighted by the very raging of the nations against him. Spotlights the victorious lamb seated on his throne. The stanza, the second part of the psalm, concludes with a chorus that we'll repeat again in verse 11. Verse 7 says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The Lord of hosts, this is the Lord of armies. He is both an army he is, and he is also a fortress. Our God is a God who has defensive protection for us, but also one who goes out to win the victory. He is with us as our fighting for force and as our fortress. He could say he's the captain of the offense and of the defense. Okay, so do not fear. What does God promise to his people in trouble? Well, he promises something better than making our trouble go away. Instead, he promises us heaven, peace, And then finally, how should we respond to God when we're in trouble? The answer to the third question that this psalm raises, how should we respond to God when we're in trouble? Look at verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. 
He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So in that second stanza, beginning in verse 4, the, the psalmist describe the city of God. In this stanza of the song, the psalmist invite others to come. Come see the city of God. Come see his victory and see how you need to respond. Okay, God doesn't just exist in a distant place. No, he acts in this place. Come, friends, come, brothers and sisters, and see the acts of God. What we see here, we could describe as a rout. Could we not? The raging nations are wrecked. Look at verse 8. They don't rot from the inside. Crumble because of God's desolation. He is executed upon them. God demolishes them. Verse 9, war ends. Yeah, well, it has to end. All the weapons are toothpicks. They're shattered. They're burned. The image I have here in my mind is from the Lord of the Rings. Okay, if you nerd out on the Lord of the Rings from time to time like me. There's these tree creatures, the Ents. You remember those? These massive creatures, and, and they're, they're slow to anger. Okay? They don't want to go to war, but man, when it is time, they crush everything in their path. With the mighty limbs that look like arms, the legs, the feet, the, the roots that crush the, the, the tiny orcs coming against them, they just turn everything into their, in their path into, into flattened piles of mush. This is some kind of a picture of what we see here. Come, come see God's works. Come see God's works. Like when he destroyed the Egyptian armies, when he brought those walls of water down upon them. Come see God's works destroying the Canaanite armies. Come see God's works when he destroyed the Assyrian armies that were gathered against the city of Jerusalem. Look, God's people don't have to win these battles. God's people, in so many cases, don't even have to fight the battles. God wins the battles for them. God wins your battles for you. Us. The psalmists invite us to come to see the weapons, the corpses of God's enemies scattered across history. But ask yourself, who reigns? Not his enemies, but God reigns. We should go back to Revelation, right? I mean, we read Revelation and we should remember how history ends. Not the very end of Revelation, just before it. Revelation chapter 19. Where John saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on that white horse is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. A ah, picture of a conquering, royal Christ. It gets a little bit ugly here. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. The name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, are following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Don't think of the Old Testament as the angry God and the New Testament as the peaceful, kind, serene, meek Jesus. He is all of that, but he is also a fearful judge. It's like the, the, the blood on his, on his clothing is the blood splattered from his time in the, in the wine press, crushing the nations. Friends, don't make Jesus less than the scriptures show that he is. He is a merciful high priest who feels with who feels the who feels with the tenderest sympathies our fears and our anxieties, but he is also a righteous judge. The injustice will crush his enemies and those who assault his people, his bride. Friends, we look at the state of the world, we, we wonder, where is God? Why is he letting this go on? What is, what is he hiding? I heard H.B. Charles, pastor in, uh, in, in Florida, say this recently. God doesn't need to be rushed 
to a secure location for his own safety. Thank you for that, HB. I needed to hear it. In fact, God not only does it need to be rushed to a secure location, he is the secure location. Friends, come to him and rest in him. So, so look at the turmoil in the world. And then look at the truth in this psalm, the truth about God. What should you do? How should you respond? What's your responsibility and your role? Look again at verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You've heard the phrase, don't just stand there, do something. I've heard people twist it the other way, and I think it captures the, the, the point of verse 10. Sometimes, hey, don't just do something, just stand there. Stand there and behold your God. Stand there and fix your hopes on what you know. What you know is that God says, I am God. I will be exalted. Friends, this is not in doubt. There is no spiritual force, no force of flesh that will keep God from being exalted among all the nations. No force that will stop him from gathering a remnant of all the nations around his throne. Some of us are inclined to want to fight evil, right? I feel that. We see leaders, we see people, we see nations that, that break God's laws, that despise God's law, that mock God's laws, that dance on, that dance on the words of Scripture, celebrate with pride in willful, deliberate, calculated rebellion. Do we want to fight with them? Do we want to go to war? Maybe there's ways we can do that. We can certainly speak the truth. And surely there are other ways that we can help others to understand the truth. Ways in which we can help people to understand their accountability to God's law. But friends, do not fight that battle. You dare not fight that battle as if you think that its victory depends on you. And let us not dare to fight that battle because we're afraid of some way in which the world comes against us. God will be exalted among the nations. Not because we fight the war, not because we win the war, not because we come up with a, a better strategy than generations before us. No, God will win the war. God will be exalted among the nations because Jesus finished his work. Because death is dead. Christ has conquered. So friends, turn to Christ. Stop warring for him and also stop warring against him. And instead, rest in him. Realize, understandably, that there's nothing you can ever do that will make yourself acceptable, acceptable to God. The only human work that can ever make you acceptable to God is the work of another human being, Jesus Christ. And his work is finished. So let us be still and look to Christ, exalted, Christ, and the throne. How should you respond to God when you're in trouble? Be still. And rest in Christ, the Lord of hosts. He is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Okay, friends, someday, today, life will test you. Somebody close to you, someone in authority over you, someone you ran, randomly encounter, maybe in traffic. How you and I respond in those moments shows not just God, it shows our kids, our spouse fellow church members. How we respond shows them how they should respond to trouble. You and I, as we face trouble today, we're going to disciple somebody in how they should respond. Will we, despite, will we disciple them towards faith and towards rest? Or will we dis disciple them towards fear and anxiety? And fight. Yes, we face trouble. Yes, we want solutions. We want to fix things. But friends, when the turmoil is out of our control, when there's nothing left that we can do except to trust God most high, that's, that's when you and I learn a little bit of trust. That's when we learn. That's when we learn whether it is really God who is our refuge and strength or whether we are looking inside for refuge and strength. What do we trust in? Do you understand? Do you rest in fact? is a very present help for you when you try to face me.
Father, remind us of our weakness. We are not strong. Father, remind us of our nakedness, our exposure, that we are no shelter, either to ourselves or to others. Make us a congregation that looks up with hope towards the city where you reign, the city that you prepare for us, and bring us home to that city soon, we pray. Until that day, keep us faithful in fulfilling the mission of ambassadors that you've entrusted us. The mission you've given to us to declare to the world that Jesus is King, and he will be exalted among all the nations. We pray these things in his name.